Okay, so now we're on to chapter five, Newton's third law of motion. We want to talk about forces and interactions, uh, Newton's third law, and then we'll end this chapter with a little discussion about vectors. So an interaction is between one thing and another. It requires a pair of forces acting on two objects. Example, the hand and the wall are pushing on each other. This is a force pair. You push on the wall, the wall pushes on you. And it turns out that all forces exist in force pairs like this. So Newton's third law of motion is whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. Example is this hammer exerts a force on this spike. The spike exerts an equal and opposite force upward on the hammer. So <clears throat> you can call one force an action force, and you can call the other force a reaction force. These are actually co-pairs. It doesn't matter which one you name the action and which one you name the reaction. But neither force can exist without the other. And these forces are equal in strength, but opposite in direction. For an example here, you have a truck exerting a force on a car, and the car exerts an equal and opposite force on the truck. You may find that hard to believe because obviously the car is getting more damage, but damage is not the same as force. It just turns out that since this car is lighter and maybe more fragile, the force that's exerted on it will, will really damage it a lot. But this truck is more massive and I guess stronger, and so that same force acting on the truck doesn't damage it as much. And also note that these action reaction uh, uh, pairs act on different objects. The truck acts on the car, the car acts on the truck. So another way to express Newton's third law is to every action there's always an opposed equal reaction. Example, the tires of this car push backwards against the road. So that's your action force. The reaction is that the road pushes forwards on the car. And this is actually how come your car goes when you step on the gas. So a simple rule to identify action and reaction forces is first look at the uh, interaction. One thing interacts with another. If you say that object A exerts a force on object B, that's your action. The reaction is that object B exerts a force on object A. Example, if you have a rocket, object A exerts a force on gas, object B, then the reaction is that the gas, object B, exerts a force on the rocket, object A. So look at this cannonball. <clears throat> the cannonball exerts a force on the little cannon. Okay. Oh, sorry, the, the cannon exerts a force on the little cannonball. And that accelerates the cannonball. But the cannonball exerts an equal and opposite force on the cannon. Okay? But if you look at Newton's second law, you will see that the acceleration of the cannonball that has a small mass will be large. But the acceleration of the cannon, which has a larger mass, will be small. So the same force exerted on a small mass produces a larger acceleration. If it's exerted on a larger mass, it produces a smaller acceleration, which is why there's a little recoil on the cannon, but the cannonball goes very quickly quickly forwards. Bam! So it's important to define your system. Consider a single enclosed orange and there's an external force causing the orange to accelerate in accordance with Newton's second law. There's no action-reaction pairs shown in this system. However, what's really going on is this apple is pulling the orange. So there is an action-reaction pair. The apple pulls the orange, the orange pulls the apple. But they don't cancel because they're acting on different things. If you consider your system to be the orange, there's an external force pulling it along and that's why it accelerates. So what if you actually consider the system to be the orange and the apple? So now the apple is part of the system and these are now internal forces. So if the apple pulls the orange, these two forces will cancel. All that could happen is maybe the, 
The apple might accelerate to the left, the orange might accelerate to the right, but the whole system will not accelerate. So there needs to be something else here. So consider the same system, but now there's an external force of friction on it. On it. Okay. So there's the same internal uh, action and reaction forces between the orange and the apple, but there's another pair of action reaction forces between the apple's feet and the floor. Okay. So one of these acts by the system, the apple acts on the floor, and that's a backwards force, but the other acts on the system. The floor acts with a forward force on the apple. And it's this external frictional force that pushes this whole system and causes the, them both to move towards the right. So the second pair of action and reaction forces do not cancel. I want to finish up chapter 5 by talking about vectors. So there's two kinds of quantities, vectors and scalars. A vector quantity has magnitude and direction and can be represented by an arrow. Examples of vectors include velocity, force, and acceleration. A scalar quantity has a magnitude only. Examples of scalars are mass, volume, speed. So the sum of two or more vectors, if the vectors are in the same direction, you can just add them arithmetically. If the vectors are in opposite directions, you can subtract them. If two vectors are not in the same direction or the opposite direction, you can use the parallelogram rule. And if they're at right angles to each other, you can find the magnitude using the Pythagorean theorem. So if V is the vertical uh, vector and H is a horizontal vector, then the resultant comes from R squared equals V squared plus H squared. So vectors have components. Vertical and horizontal components of a vector are perpendicular to each other, and the components add to give the actual vector. Here's an example of a ball in projectile motion. Okay. What happens here is that the velocity, which is this magenta vector, is changing as the ball is moving. But it always can be decomposed into a horizontal component, this blue vector, and a vertical component, this blue vector. And what happens due to gravity is that the vertical component is reduced by 10 meters per second per second. But the horizontal component doesn't change. It continues to see it's always towards the right and it's always the same length. But they add to give this magenta vector, which is first up and to the right, and lastly, down and to the right. Here's another vector problem. Nellie Newton hangs from a rope as shown, one rope that goes underneath this ring. So which side of the rope has the greater tension? Well, there's three forces acting on Nelly. The weight acts downwards, there's the tension in the left-hand side of the rope, and then the right-hand side of the rope. Because these tensions are at different angles, they may, there may be different tension forces on each side. Nelly hangs in equilibrium, so her weight is supported by two rope tensions adding vectorally to be equal and opposite to her weight. So we know her weight is down. This dashed line must be the sum of these two tensions. It must act directly up and be equal to her weight. So if you use the parallelogram rule, you will see that this tension in uh, the left-hand rope must be less than the tension in the right-hand rope so that they add to go straight up. 